Good evening, and uh, let me tell you, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm really uh, grateful for your, all you coming here tonight, and uh, I'm very happy to be um, back uh, to uh, McMaster and uh, uh, witnessing with my own eyes um, our major foreign competition to the Origins of Life Initiative at Harvard, which is your Origins Institute. We, I've met a lot of uh, great people and students uh, this past few days, and um, uh, I think we'll be able to do some great things together in the coming years. So I'm very excited about that. So I'm up here to tell you about uh, a little bit of unfinished business. And that unfinished business is what our uh, uh, distinguished colleague, astronomer Nicholas Copernicus, started 450 years ago by writing this book about astronomy. You see, the Copernican Revolution was never completed. For sure, the book that he wrote, Copernicus wrote, uh, really changed the world. The book uh, which bears, uh, spells out the name revolution, but actually has nothing to do with that. It's about astronomy and it's about the planets. Uh, brought us modern science, especially the physical sciences, brought us industry, technology, social change. However, its main assertion and uh, uh, the assertion which uh, logically followed from this, that the Earth is just another planet among the stars, remains uh, unfinished and open question until today. There is no hard evidence that there are other planets like the Earth around other stars. And uh, frankly, this is not for lack of trying or because people didn't notice at the time. People actually did notice, even back then. To them, the Copernican assertion of a moving Earth, of a moving planet on which we live, was uh, very bold and uh, quite disturbing. It really undercut, literally, um, our humanity's sense of our place in space and time, being on a moving target all the time was something which was both disturbing, unsettling, and in retrospect, also exhilarating. It meant that there are out there things which, with the power of our reason, uh, we could understand, and then we could go further and use them to the benefit of humankind, everybody thought. And that is where uh, the Copernicans, like Galileo and Kepler and Newton, came in his footsteps. And it really brought us where we are today, both in science and in technology and in a technological civilization. Today, however, we are facing a new Copernican moment. And that new Copernican moment is probably as bold and as disturbing and as exhilarating as the one which happened 450 years ago. This time it comes to us, this new revolution comes to us from the life sciences, from biology. And curiously, it is again linked to astronomy and the planets. And we, in fact, can find its seeds going back to Copernicus. You see, it was very logical if the Earth was just another planet to then uh, think of life as being there on other planets as well. On one hand, the other stars should have planets like the Earth. And uh, if there is life on Earth, why shouldn't there be life on other planets? This logical sequence of thought was followed by uh, Copernicans right away. This is uh, not the first time um, people wrote about it. Uh, De Fontenelle uh, was, in fact, the first time somebody wrote it, about it in a popular book, which became a bestseller at the time, and in a sense affected um, the way people thought. And the way people thought was that the answer to the question, is there life on other planets, received a very assertive positive answer, yes, 
there is life on other planets. But of course, nothing much was done about it. And to a great extent, nothing much was done about it because nobody really could say for sure what was life. There was no good definition, definition of life. And where we are today is that we still don't have a definition of what life is. We've gone through that Copernican revolution of modern science only to understand that there is a connection between chemistry and life. And that life is a chemistry with very special selective properties, which we call biochemistry. And that we can accomplish a lot without having a definition. Just think about that. It is true that Copernicus and then Newton uh, were at the beginning of what today we would call uh, statics and mechanics and dynamics, the way we can build a bridge, we can build an engine. But the Romans had built perfectly good bridges centuries before that without having the laws of Newton written out and understood. The same way biologists for centuries now have understood a lot about life, tremendous amount about life, without us having the basic laws and the definition of what actually that concept really means. But now we are facing a moment when we probably can make a serious step in that direction. And that's why I'm here to talk to you about this. Because I'm very excited about that. Maybe it's a, a very tall order to try to jump into the big question. And one way in which we can deal with it is to try and find easier, smaller questions around the big question we could ask. For example, one of those would be, if there was life on other planets, is that life going to be the same as life on Earth? Sounds like a simple question, and uh, I'm not really asking here whether the animals on other planets will have blue skin and funny tentacles. It is really something which has more to do with the basics of what the essence of life is, and that would be the chemistry or the molecular basis of life. So I want to say right away that I would use the word life all the time today, but what I mean by life is not human life or good and funny life. I really mean life as that concept which is not yet defined and which goes to the molecular, chemical molecular level. That chemistry, which we call biochemistry, is what I refer to as life on Earth. Let's try to start at the basis and as easy as possible and build our way up. So, in a certain sense, another way to ask the question is, is Earth biochemistry universal? Newton's law of gravity is universal, the same law that keeps us solidly on the ground here on Earth, is valid on many other planets, on Jupiter. Uh, the same law of gravity applies on a very distant galaxy as well as ours. That's a universal law, a rule that is true all over in our observable universe. Biochemistry could be one of those, or could be a set of rules that apply to the current environment, whatever that environment is. Another way to ask the same question is to think of life on Earth as being represented by this hugely diverse tree, the tree of life, but which we know has a very singular root. So the question would then be, is the root of that tree of life the same on other planets? In other words, is the molecular unity the same DNA roots that microbes to humans share on this planet something fundamentally uh, the same? So the roots are the same everywhere. And then the tree that comes out of those roots could be diverse, could be different, depending on where it was seeded. So that's really the question which scientists are now trying to answer. 
How does diversity spring from uniformity? And to a great extent, this is the mystery which underlies uh, life on this planet and which brings us to ask the question the way I do right now. Because we already know enough about the molecular basis of life on Earth to see that there is a very singular unity of biochemistry from which all this rich diversity uh, comes out. And when I say singular unity of biochemistry, what I mean by this is there is a very limited set of molecules and chemical processes which are entirely used by life and nothing else is. While at the same time, chemistry provides millions of other possibilities. So life really constrained itself on this planet to a fairly well-defined set. And we, to this moment, don't understand exactly why that is so, given the uh, propensity of what we call life to explore all the possibilities that are there. And there is some beauty in that as well. That is from something very unitary, very uh, well-defined, you are able to produce something very rich and diverse, from microbes to us. But probably there is a seed of the big answer to the difficult question in this unity of biochemistry. And it is important to try to understand it. So, when we talk about the plurality of words, worlds today, just like the Fontenelle did 400 years ago, that plurality of worlds takes on a whole new meaning. It is no longer uh, the many planets around the distant stars, but actually understanding the place of life in that connection to the diversity of planets and the possible diversity of life. And so here the question immediately comes, why do planets come front and center in trying to answer this question again. Why do we always talk about life on planets? The universe is a much bigger place. Aren't there any other environments in that bigger universe that could harbor or help life emerge or sustain it? A lot has happened in astronomy in the last 10 to 20 years. We've managed to see and understand a lot of the world around us, the bigger observable universe, almost to the point beyond uh, uh, where we see the first stars and the first galaxies forming. So it is worthwhile for me to spend a couple of minutes in telling you about that because I suspect that a lot of the results which only came out in the last few years may not be completely familiar to you but they relate to my story in a very substantial way. So let me tell you a little bit about the life story of the universe. This is a life story which is not uh, an invention, but really a set of well-observed uh, images and measurements which we can do today. What we can do today is see a very clear sequence of events happening from going back almost 14 billion years. From the present days where we see galaxies made of stars and clusters of galaxies, uh, hundreds of billions of them arranged in very particular uh, ways. Going back with the largest telescopes, we see almost to the point of the first forming galaxies and in the next five years, we should be able to see the first forming stars. And then beyond that, a period uh, which is called the cosmic microwave background last scattering event, which we see directly. It is not something which is inferred. This is actually a part of that map which was produced in the last few years, which actually shows us a period which precedes uh, the period in the history of the universe when there were stars and galaxies and certainly planets. There were no planets, no stars and galaxies. What is even more important is in this pattern of waves in the uh, fairly hot gas that we see at that distance, we see evidence uh, that 
It is made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. I would say entirely of hydrogen and helium with a smothering of lithium. There is no carbon, there is no oxygen, there are no metals. There are certainly no planets or anything which could uh, produce chemical bonds in the complexity which we would call life, let alone even simple chemistry. So today we are able to see part of the early universe which is before the time that chemistry could be possible. And then we see the first stars, and then later on we see for the first time the synthesis of the elements from the light elements like carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, all the way to the very heavy elements, uh, which are synthesized in stars, and which slowly but surely enrich the universe in those elements. And it is somewhere there between the present day and uh, the first few generations of stars that the first planets can actually form. And certainly, the first planets like our own, which are solid. You can't form a solid planet from hydrogen and helium. And you cannot, again, you cannot have a history of chemistry unfolding without the Mendeleev table of the elements, so at least some of it. So this is a story of the universe which is uh, again, clearly seen, I'm showing you here a picture of one of those uh, space probes, which is called the Wilkinson uh, microwave um, uh, anisotropy probe, which in fact made the map that I'm referring to here. So in that universe that we've mapped so well now, from the point before there were stars and planets to today, we see a lot of different environments. There are, of course, the galaxies, which are made up of stars, and a lot of still loose hydrogen and helium gas with some dust in it, uh, which hasn't formed stars yet or planets. And then, increasingly, we discover that almost uh, every star has a companion, and in most cases, those companions are planets. We are on the verge of completing the Copernican Revolution. In the next two years, we'll be able to actually discover planets just like the Earth around other stars, and in a sense, close that chapter. But what we also see is that when it comes to complex chemistry, there are very few places where that complex chemistry could occur. I would say that among all the possible locales in the observable universe, there are only two places where you can talk about complex chemistry. One of them is planets, uh, the Earth and Mars and similar planets are obviously the place. And the other one is some very dense uh, clouds of gas which are in between the stars in the galaxies, the beautiful pictures of uh, the galactic spiral arms. Well, turns out that in order to sustain a phenomenon which is long-lived, long those clouds are not a good place to be. We call them clouds for a good reason. They are like clouds. They come and go. They form stars. They disappear. They break apart. You could form some complex molecules in them, and we see them with our radio telescopes. But forming a complex community of chemically interacting entities, what we call the microbes, on our own planet requires a much different kind of environment. And think a little bit about that because the universe, in a certain sense, geologically speaking, is a very young entity. It's not an old thing. It is only, only 14 billion years old, in fact, less than 14 billion years old. And life, that is the Earth biosphere, is about 4 billion years old. So that ratio, that comparison between the age of the entire observable universe and the age of that continuing entity with the same uh, DNA roots of the same DNA molecules, the same processes, has been continuing and going on for four billion years. That is an entity which is almost as old as the universe, or in human terms, it's like an offspring of that universe. You can think of the universe as the parent and life as a whole, as a process, as being the offspring. 
In a certain sense, you can also say that because we expect this universe to continue for a very, very long time in the future, there is no particular evidence why it should uh, dramatically change anytime soon, we are also the first generation of that phenomenon which we call life. I mean, defining generation in the same way we do it in human terms doesn't mean that a generation is exactly of the same age. It is a range of ages, isn't it? So if the parent is uh, the equivalent of 14 and the first generation is four, that's, that is the first generation. So we are one of that first generation of, of life because life was not possible before the first planets could form. And that was not that long time ago. So it is planets that uh, interrelated again to the basic question of how do we understand what life is and how it could emerge from chemistry. Because that's, that's where it happens. In a certain sense, it doesn't happen on the planet. It is the planet that develops life. So you, 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 should, you should think of it as planets that develop life as opposed to life somehow comes to a planet, inhabits it like we inhabit our houses, and then maybe leaves it and goes to another place. But the, light, the planet itself develops into a living planet. It is the chemistry. Like, if you look at our planet Earth from afar uh, and uh, kind of in a detached way, what you would say is, well, that planet, compared to Mars, for example, developed some very strange chemistry. And that strange chemistry boiled over and sent a little bits of itself to the moon and then came back. And, you know, that, that's what it actually looks like um, when you think about it. It is that the planet Earth that did that in a certain sense. I'm not trying to <laughs> talk about the Gaia hypothesis here, but it's really understanding that the chemistry is in The chemistry that we call life is really a planetary phenomenon. It is not necessarily something which came, comes from a different domain in this universe. It really happens on planets. Okay, so let's go and find those planets then. The Earth itself is such a tiny blue dot, such a tiny planet, that when you use one of our best cameras, which is now in uh, orbit around the planet Saturn, as you speak, on the Cassini spacecraft, and look back towards the Sun, the Sun is right behind Saturn, so it's not very bright uh, being eclipsed there. The Earth being close to the Sun from the vantage point of being behind Saturn looks like this tiny blue dot there. It's very difficult to actually discover those small planets around bright stars. And that's why it took 400 years to come to that point that we can actually do something which Copernicus was expecting we'll, we'll have to anticipate and finish at some point. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing is, if we are talking about life on other planets, we should probably look back at our own solar system and understand that it is the small planets, Mercury, Mars, Earth, and Venus, that are solid, and the big planets, that are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are really big balls of gas, that same gas that is so prominent and everywhere in our young universe, hydrogen and helium. And when you have hydrogen and helium and so much of it, uh, curiously, you can't do very much in terms of complex chemistry. For those who do chemistry, we call this very highly diluted uh, uh, chemical dilution in which you can't really do very much. The beautiful colors of the clouds of Jupiter and Saturn are due to photochemistry and to relatively large molecules uh, which form those clouds and have beautiful colors. But they're nothing compared to the kind of molecules and the large uh, size of the molecules that are necessary to, for life to emerge and to be sustained when there is no solid surface. So we are really concentrating on the small ones. And the small ones, fortunately, are not all that small. In our solar system, the largest of the solid planets is, of course, our own, the Earth. But it turns out that around other stars, uh, that's not necessarily true. And that's very good news. Uh, there is a whole new class of planets that we've started discovering literally in the last two years, which uh, by fluke um, 
I was one of the people who participated in naming them 10 years ago when we were writing a proposal to NASA for a new spacecraft to look for them. <laughs> and uh, we were looking, I was looking for a name for them and it just in astronomy we call anything that is much bigger than anything else super size of that, super giant, super novi, and so on. So I thought, well, these are much bigger Earths, so let's call them super Earths. And um, didn't think very much about it, but now the name stuck, so everybody uses the name super Earths. Anyway, some of them are just like, like super Earths, super sized Earths. This is, if that's the Earth, that will be a planet that is five times more massive than the Earth, rocky, but five times more massive, so it's larger, but not by, by, that much. On the other hand, there is a whole new class here, which uh, is uh, predominantly made of water. You see, there is a lot of water in the universe. Why? Because the universe is mostly made of hydrogen, and the universe has a lot of oxygen. The stars produce, synthesize, through their thermonuclear reactions, a lot of oxygen. So H2O, there is a lot of water in the universe, and you can have planets which contain a lot of it, without containing the hydrogen and helium uh, that happens when you have a gas giant like Neptune. So if you have a planet which is one Earth mass, that is the same amount of mass like the Earth, but made 50% out of water, it's of course is bigger because water is less compressible, it's less dense. So this will be ocean planets or water planets. These ones are too dilute chemically to look for life on them. These ones may have too much water to look for life, but we're still working on finding out. But these ones, are for all practical purposes as good as the Earth when it comes to chemistry and to possibility for life. So that's a good news, why? Because uh, we have a sufficiently difficult time discovering and studying planets as small as the Earth, so it really helps if the planet is a little bit bigger in size. It's easier to discover and it's easier to study. So that's one of the plans, is start that journey by observing the super Earth and looking for signatures there, and then we'll work our way down to the smaller Earths. So what is the current status of that uh, program to completing the Copernican revolution? Well, in our own Milky Way galaxy, which would look like that if we could look from above with the spiral arms, in the vicinity of the solar system, uh, that's where we can really look uh, with uh, sufficient precision, as of Essentially, today we have about 500 planets discovered. Most of these are Jupiter-like, Saturn-like planets. They're discovered with a technique which looks for the tiny wobble of the star due to their mass. So they're massive planets and they, they're able to pull on its star. Uh, so that's good, but it's nowhere close to our uh, goals of discovering smaller solid planets. Uh, if you take that number and say, um, in our galaxy, there are that many stars, and uh, um, there are that many uh, smaller planets that you would expect to find around those stars. You can make an estimate of how many planets do you expect in our galaxy to be with uh, potential for habitability, with potential similar to that of the Earth. And fortunately, the number comes out to be very large, because the galaxy is a large place, and there are many stars. And stars tend to have planets, as we now realize. So 100 million planets means that we have targets to look for, which is a very good uh, thing to... We don't need to find all 100 million there of them, but uh, just a dozen will do fine, thank you. So that will be great. So what do we do about that? Well, there is another technique which can do very well in uh, searching for small planets. And in fact, at this point, it's the best way to find the small planets. And that's called the transit method, which is illustrated here in this uh, little animation. Of course, uh, we don't see uh, the star as a disk, and we don't see the planet as a big dark blob. What we see is the brightness dimming periodically by just a little bit um, over and over again as the planet comes back. A little mini eclipse. That uh, technique works very well. We already have but close to 100 transiting planets discovered that way. Most of them are, of course, big, uh, like Jupiter. Uh, but it can be made to work for very small, uh, very small planets. It is also my favorite technique 
for another reason, because when the planet is in front of its star, and then half an orbit later behind its star, uh, it actually um, allows you to do two things. The first thing it allows you to do is to measure its size. You see, you don't see the disk, but the amount of brightness that it drops down here depends on the area. So the bright area is covered by a little dark area. And assuming that the star and the planets are both round, which is a good assumption, you can get the radius. And that's a very good assumption, it turns out. So that's good. The next thing then you can do is go to the old technique of the wobble of the star and get the mass of the planet. And when you have the mass and the radius, you get the mean density. And when you have the mean density, you can infer the composition, what the planet is made of in bulk. Is it dry and rocky, or does it have a lot of water? It turns out, actually, that you can do even more. When the planet is transiting in front of its star, you can actually peer through its atmosphere just for that period of time, the light that passes through the atmosphere. And you can actually, turns out, determine some of the gases in that atmosphere. That was done already for several planets. You can see water vapor. You can see carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, and things like that. So transits are great. So the first step is let's discover the small planets. Second step is let's find out what we can uh, uh, find out about them and how do we do it with the transits. So the big project which is doing that now in finding this new Earth with the transiting method is uh, 10 years in the making. It's called Kepler. We named it after one of the Copernicans, Johannes Kepler. It was launched uh, more than a year ago. It's uh, working successfully now with a full year of uh, scientific data in the can from it. And uh, it's uh, literally a big, high uh, resolution and a large field camera. All it is is a large field digital camera, a telescope with a big camera in it, which is orbiting behind the Earth, kind of away from interference, observing just one big field in the uh, northern sky. It's actually in the summer, it's above. It's in the constellation of Cygnus. And monitoring uh, 150,000 stars for those telltale signs of dimming, periodic dimming, which tell us that probably around that star there is a small planet orbiting. So we already have uh, quite a few planets discovered. One of the most recent ones uh, is uh, what we call Kepler-9, which has two Saturn-like planets in close orbits. And both of those planets are or uh, transiting. So we know the densities for both of them. And we see how both of them play a tug of war uh, uh, with each other as they pull on each other ever so slightly which is an effect that uh, Laplace discovered back a century after Copernicus and explained uh, a similar tug of war played between Jupiter and Saturn in our own solar system. So Kepler is working great and is on, on its way to actually do what we uh, were trying to do for 450 years, complete the Copernican revolution, close that chapter. And so, as I told you, this happens at a very interesting coincidental moment of a time when biology has come to a point of asking again, with the tools of science, the big question, what is life and is there life on other planets? And those two come together in what I would predict is the next big Copernican moment or revolution. That combination of what we generally refer to as synthetic biology and planetary science. And by synthetic biology here, um, I would uh, specifically refer to our ability to understand alternative uh, ways to build a chemistry that behaves like life on Earth, what we would call an alternative biochemistry. Uh, not simply genetic engineering, which sometimes is referred to synthetic biology, 
but creating systems which are living in the same sense in which the biochemistry that has worked for four billion years on, on this planet has worked. That will allow us to understand both the nature of life and more importantly, how to look for its signatures in other places. How do you look for something which you don't understand? How do we look for life that we've never encountered before? Most likely we'll simply overlook it. We'll never know it was there. So now that we understand that life is a planetary phenomenon and we want to look for it on other planets and we also have a way to test that in the lab, there is this uh, convergence of the two uh, scientific disciplines. The chemists and the biologists would like us to tell them what are the conditions that are naturally occurring on other planets, not just on Earth and Mars, but on other planets in general. And we would in turn like them to tell us, the astronomers, what are the telltale signs of alternative biochemistry we should be looking on those other planets. Maybe we will discover that biochemistry is un universal, just like the law of uh, Newton's law. So that will be great. So then we'll be looking for the same biochemistry like that on Earth. The richness of the tree of life on another planet may be very different, but the biochemistry at least will be the same. We'll know how to look for it. But we are not there yet. We haven't done our homework. So let me tell you just briefly about some of that homework. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about two of the projects that we are doing in our origins initiative at Harvard which relate to that combination of the uh, two disciplines that uh, I refer to. Uh, I hope you can see that. So one of the very common environments on solid planet surfaces is the production and availability of clay. And I would say clays, because there are different types of clays, which is a result of very common planetary processes. There are a lot of clays on the surface of the Earth. There always have been. There are a lot of clays on the surface of Mars as well. So um, what um, one of our team members, Jack Shostak, in his lab discovered some time ago is that clay in a water solution has this very uh, important and interesting uh, pr properties of containing uh, little particles, tiny microscopic particles, that help assemble molecules uh, which are capable of uh, carrying information. Uh, this particular example, which is shown here, which has been done in the lab, but is shown here as simulation, shows the uh, assembly the natural assembly of a molecule which is called RNA, which is kind of the cousin of the DNA, and uh, has two very important properties. It can carry uh, genetic information just like DNA does, but it can do something which DNA cannot do. It can copy itself, make, catalyze its own self-replication. So it's a very important conceptually molecule. So in a sense, we're looking for similar conceptually similar molecules. It turns out that there is a very interesting uh, 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 combination of clay in solution and the ability to assemble these kind of structures from molecules which would naturally occur on planets. And we know on meteorites we see them, these small molecules which then arrange themselves in a nice sequence. The next thing which also relates to clays, and I'm afraid uh, it's too bright here to see it very clearly, is uh, that also in clay solutions, um, it's very common to uh, find molecules which are called lipids. They're fairly simple molecules, uh, carbon-based as many others are, which uh, have uh, the property of being a little string which is uh, attractive to water on one side and repelling water on the other side. So think of that, uh, hydrophilic on one side, hydrophobic on the other side. And molecules like that in water tend to arrange themselves in little uh, bubbles, uh, actually not even bubbles, but micelles, meaning all the hydrophobic ends 
butt against each other like this, and the hydrophilic ones are on the outside. They are red, if you can see the color red and white on those pictures. It turns out that, again, in clay solutions, in different clay solutions, these kind of micelles would naturally um, um, form membranes which uh, would then close on themselves uh, very often to form bubbles or vesicles, empty inside, uh, having hydrophilic ends on the inside and the on, on the outside. So there are two layers of those molecules that form the membrane of a bubble. Very much like a cell structure. That was also done in the lab and is very easy to reproduce in uh, Jack Shostak's lab. So the combination of what you saw before and what you see here, all mediated by the clay particles in the water solution, then leads to a very interesting situation in which those molecules that assemble on the clay particles can, can end up in some of those bubbles, in some of those vesicles. So then they're too big uh, to be able to actually go through that membrane. But the individual pieces which make them, which are much smaller than the bigger molecule, the nucleotides, actually have no problem passing through the membrane. These lipids uh, uh, moving all the time, and small molecules can come and go through. But once they go inside, they attach themselves to the longest strings, and they can no longer come out. Then, uh, last year, um, um, one of the graduate students of Jack in his lab realized that as uh, those bubbles grow from the natural growth of those molecules inside them, they actually uh, tend to break apart in a very interesting way. Not exactly the way you see it in this uh, animation in two parts, but they form these very long stringy filaments, like tubes, and the tru tubes pearl up into individual bubbles. And each one of those bubbles now contains one or few or sometimes none of those molecules which can self-replicate themselves, RNA strands, for example which is a natural way to uh, jumpstart uh, a system that behaves like a Darwinian evo evolving system, Darwinian evolution at the molecular level, in simple naturally occurring bubbles which act like cells. So <clears throat> how, how could we uh, take advantage of that? Well, it turns out that uh, on one hand, we can define more clearly uh, the planetary conditions for those clay solutions in order to see what works and what doesn't work. On the other hand, these simple cell-like structures are not what we would call it anywhere close to life, but can be used in a synthetic biology sense as a way to create a minimal cell, a system which performs the minimal um, reactions or processes that we see in naturally occurring cells. The, one of the easiest way to do that and to be sure that you have a good clean experiment is to try to make such a minimal cell in exactly the same way uh, like an existing one, but flip the uh, symmetry of the molecules. As you uh, may know, the entire tree of life on Earth, from its root with all its diversity, is based on proteins which are made of amino acids. But most of these amino acids have left-handed and right-handed occurring symmetry in natural conditions. However, life only uses the left-handed ones. And then the corresponding sugars would be right-handed. So the experiment could be to copy exactly a very simple microbe, uh, produce the individual molecules, but with exactly the opposite symmetry, something which has never been seen and does not exist on this planet, and compare that minimal cell to the control sample of the left-handed one. So we call it the Mirror Life Project. We hope that this will give us a 
small clue in the direction of why did life on Earth ended up being left-handed as opposed to right-handed or a mixture of the two. By mixture of the two, I don't mean that you can have successful life which has a mixture of left-handed to right-handed amino acids. This is well understood. It has to be either left-handed entirely or right-handed entirely. But there is no particular reason why there are not some microbes which are right-handed. So that's the plan. Uh, we hope to finish the project in a year or two, and we'll be able to subject those little uh, cells in those vesicles that I showed you uh, in the clay solution to the different environments of planets uh, or the early Earth and see whether they behave in a different way. The bottom line of all this, however, is that um, what is coming in terms of the science uh, of this is there is this combination of work in the lab and what we are doing in the planetary science, which is coming together over that huge gap in our knowledge and understanding, which is the question of the origins of life and the, what life is. It is like a building a bridge from both sides. And when we become capable of designing systems of that sort, it will be the same kind of knowledge and capability which we had um, a century ago by understanding organic chemistry and being able to, for example, make plastics or uh, make products which we all use today. But in a whole new level of understanding and capability where the products make themselves and sustain themselves um, instead of being inert, like an organic chemistry. So that's kind of one of the ways in which you can think about synthetic biology. The other way in which you could think about synthetic biology it, is that in its essence, by going a step towards helping us understand what life is, in a new way it tells us what our own place in the universe is. What is it? Are we really the current level at which that process with its tree of life has reached on this planet? And is the root something universal or not? That is where all this is coming to. And I want to thank my team for the great work which they are doing. And I'm happy to answer your questions now. Thank you. <laughs>